would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, worshiping, raising our voices as one, acknowledging that you are God, that you are good, that you are merciful, that you love us deeply. God, we know that you have gathered us by your Spirit in this place. You've brought us from all sorts of different places and circumstances and and things going on in our lives this morning. And God, we know what else is true is that you don't gather us in vain, but you gather us because you have something for us. That, that you long to make yourself known to us. And God, we know as we open up your word today, that that's true. God, would your word this morning as we dive into it, would it comfort, would it delight, would it teach, would it correct, would it challenge? God, would you by your spirit make it so uh, this morning for us? God, would the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be pleasing and honoring to you? In Jesus' name, amen. I mentioned before that we get to continue this morning into this sermon series that we've been calling Refuel. And if you haven't been with us, we've been looking at Scripture and the nature of Scripture and the realization that Scripture uh, feeds us and nourishes us. Much like food, when we eat food, our body metabolizes it and uses that food as nourishment and energy for us to grow and to be healthy and to, to, to continue growing. And Scripture is the same way. The Holy Spirit, as we dwell in the Word, as we engage Scripture, as we seek the Lord through the Word, we trust that the Holy Spirit metabolizes the Word in our lives and in our hearts so that we may grow spiritually as well. And there's been a couple really cool things that I've enjoyed this series so far. I I really love getting to hear from all of you, like Laura shared this morning. It's such a gift to get to hear from you and from your voices, to hear the word of the Lord from your voices. What a gift that's been for me. I, I think maybe one of the other things I would name that's really cool is that I get the opportunity to share with you things from Scripture that have been meaningful and formative to me. And I I oftentimes this summer get to share with you passages that that I just really love to teach and really love to preach. And today's text is an example of that. Jonah, the book of Jonah is a a special book to me. I I grew up in the church. I grew up in Sunday school and the flannel grams, right? Flannel grams, I think that's what they're called. If, If you grew up in the church, maybe you remember those too. But I remember growing up just knowing Jonah as the guy that got swallowed by the fish. That Jonah was the guy that was in the, in the belly of the fish and uh, prayed to God and God found favor and the fish spit him out and he was fine. That's how I always remembered Jonah. But as, the cor- as I matured and grew in my faith, I came to know that Jonah is much more than that. There's much more to this short Old Testament book than just this one aspect of Jonah's story. And one of the reasons that this book is special to me is that this book is one of the first that that I studied really deeply in seminary. And it was in a Hebrew class. Uh, It was in a Hebrew class looking at the Old Testament. And Hebrew is the original language of the Old Testament. And over the course of a semester, my classmates and I were given this daunting task and what seemed like an insurmountable task to translate the book of Jonah from Hebrew to English. Word by word, line by line, it all got translated. And don't ask me to do it today. There's been a lot of, a lot of days gone by since this happened, but word by word, line by line, it got done. And over the course of doing so, I, I found myself not only falling in love with the Hebrew language and the book of Jonah, but also with scripture as a whole. I just found myself loving more and more scripture and and, and what God does through scripture. As words went from Hebrew to English and verb tenses and language paradigms and all these things were floating through my head, what I found was that often I would see these words on these pages, that I would see them as a two-dimensional black and white word on the page, when in reality they are a three-dimensional revelation of who God is. A three-dimensional revelation of God's interaction with God's people. And in turn, then, God's interaction with 
you and me. This assignment, this Hebrew assignment, really gave me a whole new appreciation for the depth, for the richness, and the, the, the nuance and the beauty found on every one of these pages. These pages that we can hold and open up whenever we want. It helped me realize and see that every single word, every single word is important. Every word has meaning, and without the whole of Jonah, and without the whole of Scripture altogether, without the whole of all of that in view, we get an incomplete picture of who God is. We get an incomplete picture of what the kingdom of God is like. I believe the Holy Spirit taught me Uh, that every single word, even the mundane ones, that none of them are wasted. That none of them are wasted in the way that God uses Scripture in my life and in your life. So I'd love to, like, get into a Hebrew lesson today. I'd love to share with you the nuances of the Hebrew language in Jonah because I know it sounds kind of nerdy, but it'd be super fun super fun. But we can't do that today. But what I can do is share just a small piece of this short book with you. So we're going to do that today to help us maybe see beyond Jonah, beyond just the the fish story. So if you have a Bible, open it up to Jonah 1. Uh, If you have a phone, you can open up the Bible app to Jonah 1. Otherwise, the words are going to be on the screen behind me. We're going to read Jonah 1, verse 1 through 16 together this morning. So hear now the word of the Lord. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare, and he went on board to go with them, to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we don't perish. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country, and of what people are you? I'm a Hebrew. He replied, I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up, throw me into the sea. And then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it's because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to the land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up, and they threw him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to ask, I want to ask us all a question today. Can you think of a time where God showed up in your life? Maybe a better way to put that is, can you think of a time where God interrupted your life? 
Maybe a time where God showed up and asked something of you or made something happen in your life, maybe that you would say is positive or maybe you would say it was challenging. But can you think of a time where God interrupted your life? Another question would be, how did you respond to that? If you can think of a time where God showed up and maybe God interrupted your life, how did you respond to that? The question is, when when God shows up like he does in the storm in Jonah 1, or when God interrupts our life like he interrupted Jonah's life with this call and this word, how do we respond? When God shows up in ways that seem to go against maybe even our hopes and maybe even our desires, how do we respond? In this text today, God shows up in a number of ways for a number of people. God does a lot of interrupting for a lot of people, and we see contrasting examples of how people respond, right? The sailors and Jonah couldn't have showed up any more differently. They couldn't have responded any more differently, could they? So we're going to look at that today. But first, let's talk about Jonah. Let's get to know Jonah a little bit, and let's understand a little more about Nineveh. Jonah is a prophet. We, we don't know a ton about Jonah. Jonah only comes up in the book of Jonah and once in 2 Kings, where he's mentioned as a prophet. We know that Jonah is a prophet, even though we don't know him well. And much like the prophets that we are familiar with, like a Jeremiah or an Isaiah, much like them, Jonah would hear a word from the Lord and would be sent to a place or a people to deliver that word on behalf of the Lord. So that's what's happening here. Jonah is given this message to, to, to deliver it to the city of Nineveh on behalf of the Lord. God says in verse, uh, in verse 1, uh, verse 2, Go at once, their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah's being sent to Nineveh to correct, to, to, to show that, that, that God believes that Nineveh has gone too far away from God, and Jonah's sent there to help them understand how to come back to God. That's the message that Jonah is given, that Nineveh has strayed and God wants them to come back. And like most every time when God interacts with a prophet, there's an urgency, right? In in the Hebrew language, this go at once, this is a command. This is an imperative verb. This is not a suggestion. God's not like, hey, Jonah, what are you doing today? You want to go over there to Nineveh? This is a command. Go and do. Jonah is being sent by God as a command to go to Nineveh. And let's be clear about this urgency. This urgency is not God desiring to destroy Nineveh. This is an urgency because God can't wait for Nineveh to come back to him. God can't wait for Nineveh's straying to stop. God's desire here is not destruction. God's desire is redemption. I want to encourage you to read the rest of Jonah this week. Go back and read 2, 3, and 4. And when you get to 4, what we see together is that God does desire Nineveh to be redeemed. God does desire that Nineveh be saved. God is a God that desires his creation to be in community with him. God longs for this. And God is using Jonah as an instrument to bring about that redemption. And Jonah knows that. Jonah knows that too. And that's exactly why Jonah responds the way that he does when God interrupts him. This is exactly why Jonah runs the other way. In Jonah 1, we see that Jonah is saying, nope, I'm out. I'm not going to go do what you're asking me to do or what you're telling me to do. I'm not going to go to Nineveh. In fact, I'm going to go to Tarshish. I'm going to go away from Nineveh, the exact opposite way. Chapter 4, we learn that Jonah didn't go because he knew God wouldn't destroy them. Jonah didn't go because he knew that God wanted to save and redeem his creation, and Jonah said that's too much. It's too far. Jonah didn't want to be about that. Jonah didn't want to be the instrument that brought Nineveh back to God. 
But look again at verse 3. The words say this. He set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And we see this, this from the presence of the Lord a couple different times here right away. So let's, let's not miss it. When this shows up multiple times, that means it's important. What he's saying is he's not just going away from Nineveh. He's not just saying no to Nineveh. He's saying no to God. He's fleeing the very presence of of the Lord. The Lord uh, dwelt, dwelt in the temple, and he's getting as far from the temple as possible. Jonah's saying, I don't even want to be in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to go to Tarshish and be away. To, I'm going to be in a place where God can't see me, God can't hear me, God can't know me, and I can't know God either. Jonah's fleeing the presence of the Lord. He's quitting. He's out. He's resigning from being a prophet, if I can Put that so lax. He's trying to get as far away as possible, and it's quite extreme, right? This interruption, this interruption that God says, I'm going to send you to Nineveh. To get Nineveh to stop straying and to come back, that was too much for Jonah. But why? Why is this too much? What's the deal with Nineveh? What's the deal with this place? What about Nineveh makes this too much for Jonah? What about Nineveh makes Jonah decide, I'd rather see it destroyed? Frankly, Nineveh was not a great place at this point. Historically, we know that Nineveh was not a, a great place to be. Nineveh was the capital city of the kingdom of Assyria. And Assyria is not good in this time in history either. Assyria has no allies. Assyria has no friends. The, Assyria is huge. And quite literally, they are a steamroller rolling over anybody or anything that stands in the way of their, their expansion of power. I tried to think of a, a comparison today, and I, I, I couldn't. Quite frankly, the, the cruelest and most brutal political regimes today pale in comparison to Assyria. And Nineveh, as the capital of Assyria, would have embodied all of that. All of that would have been on display in Nineveh as the representative city, the capital city. And we read about Nineveh a couple other places. Zephaniah and Nahum actually write a little bit about it, and it's all bad. Nahum writes this, uh, that nobody has ever escaped the Assyrians' endless cruelty. They were extremely cruel to people that weren't them. They were extremely brutal to captives. They were extremely cruel to people that stood against them. They would do things like display bodies and bones in the streets to make known to everybody watching what happens to anybody that stands against Assyria. This city of Nineveh was the epitome of man-made power. The epitome of glorifying power and might and cruelty. Jonah didn't want to see them redeemed. Jonah didn't want to see God redeem them. Jonah wanted to see God destroy them. And that's why he fled. That was his response to God's word was to flee. So he hops a boat. He goes to Tarshish, which if you look on a map, Tarshish is a long way away. It's a long way away. He's trying to get the exact opposite of Nineveh. Hops on a boat, he thinks he's home free, but obviously he's not, right? God sends this storm, and this is another interruption where God shows up and interrupts, and another opportunity for us to see another response of God showing up. And it's quite a scene, right? The storm rages, it's growing and growing and growing to the point that these professional sailors are tossing their cargo overboard. And where's Jonah in all this? He's sleeping under the, uh, under the deck. He's fast asleep sailors they cry out to all the gods that they can think of i i imagine this picture right these sailors they're not israelites they don't know the god of israel i imagine them sort of just going through this mental checklist of okay cry out to this god cry out to this god cry out to this god and and n there's no response obviously just go through the list of who to cry out to and they finally say well let's go to this guy that's sleeping under the boat let's ask him to cry out to his god God, the one true God, hears them. God recognized them. God shows up, and even though reluctantly, 
these sailors throw Jonah overboard. And instantly, the storm stops. The sailors come away from this differently than they came into it, right? Again, these aren't Israelites, and this is super cool. These are not sailors that know who God is, but yet they come away from this interaction. They come away from what they've just experienced, knowing who God is, seeing a glimpse of God's nature. The very same God that Jonah's running from, these sailors are now giving a sacrifice to and making vows to. And what that means is, in the, in the Hebrew language, what that means is they made vows, they feared the Lord as they had reverence for the Lord. And these vows are, are implying that they are desiring this deeper, longer relationship with this God that just showed up in a big way. Again, the very same God that Jonah is running from. Pretty stark contrast, isn't it? The sailors and the Jonah, or sailors and Jonah, the, God showed up to both of those groups, and Jonah ran away. Jonah put his own desires, his own assessment of what's best ahead of God's assessment of what's best, so much so that he was quite willing to die. And even for a moment, quite willing to allow a boat full of others to die to avoid doing something he didn't want to do. Now, I think, if I'm honest, this, uh, this, this active disobedience is what makes this story the most interesting to me. It, it's interesting to me that Jonah, a prophet, displays such disobedience. Jonah knows better. Jonah knows, of all people, Jonah knows that God is sovereign, that God is everywhere. There is no escaping God, and God's will will be done. Jonah knows this. He knows that even if he says no to God, that God will do what God pleases to do. And yet he chooses to run away. He still decides to run from God in an effort to hold on to his own will, his own choice, his own decision. I, I read this quote uh, about Jonah, about his disobedience. Uh, this is a, a quote from a Bible commentator. Uh, what can be more wicked, more disobedient than knowing what God wants, hearing God's direction, and then saying no to God? I'm always struck by Jonah's actions when I read this especially compared to the sailors' actions. And again, I urge you to keep reading Jonah this week. Read the rest of the book. But I'm always struck by Jonah. In chapter 4, Jonah says, I'm going to paraphrase, Jonah says, See, I knew you'd save them. He says in an angry posture to God, See, God, this is why I didn't want to come here, because I knew you'd save them. It makes me wonder. It makes me wonder and it makes me evaluate the ways that maybe, maybe I'm running from God. And maybe the ways that I'm uh, avoiding what God might be calling me to. It makes me curious of what my response is when God shows up in my life or when God interrupts my life and my plans and asks me to go somewhere where I don't want to go or asks me to, to say something to someone that maybe I don't want to say, or when God asks me to do something I don't want to do. Or how do I respond when God wants to do something that I'm not sure I want him to do? I want to ask all of you today, what is it that God is calling you to? Where is God calling you and what is God asking of you today that maybe you might feel some resistance to? See, Jonah is really a story about God's heart for redemption of his creation. In chapter 4, verse 10, it says this. When God saw what they did, Nineveh, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said that he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. He did not do it. From the moment that Adam and Eve fell after eating the fruit that God said, don't eat that fruit, from that moment on, all of Scripture, all of Scripture is a story 
about how God is working to redeem his creation, the creation that he loves, which, guess what, includes you and me. Cover to cover, including, including this little four-chapter book of Jonah, the, the God that's revealed to us, the God that, that, that God decides to show us of himself is a God that longs deeply for his creation to be brought back to him. The God that's revealed is a God that goes to, to great lengths to redeem you and me and our neighbors and our coworkers back to himself. It's a God that reveals himself to be a God that takes great steps to redeem even Nineveh. It's this redemptive action. It's this work of redeeming his creation that Jonah was invited to participate in and chose out. If you read all of Jonah, which I'm, I'm hoping you do, if you read all of it, you'll see I'm not sure Jonah ever gets it. I'm not sure Jonah ever comes around to wanting to see Nineveh redeemed. The book ends with Jonah still pretty angry at God for what God wants to do and what God did. But here's what's true for us. What's true for us is that God is up to something right here, right now. In, in your life and in the life of our community. God is doing redemptive work this very moment. God is actively bringing, bringing the kingdom into our community, bringing shalom and flourishing to his people. And his people are you and me. And the community around us, God loves deeply and wishes to redeem. The, the kingdom of God is breaking in every single day. And we, friends, for some unknown reason, we are invited to participate in that. We're invited to come along with God. We're invited to see what he's doing in this place and how he's gathering his creation back to himself. We are invited to participate in witnessing lives transformed, witnessing people hear about belonging and rest and hope when maybe they've never heard of that before. We have the privilege of seeing relationships mended, of seeing people come to know the gospel for the first time. And that gospel is that God loves you, God loves our neighbors so deeply, deeply enough that he would send Jesus die so that he could be in community with each and every one of us. This is what Jonah was called to, and this is what Jonah ran from. Sure, he ran away from a dangerous place. Sure, he ran away from a, a threat of people that could have killed him. Sure, he ran away from hard conversations. He ran away from people that he deemed unworthy of being saved. But in reality, what he ran from, what he missed, was a beautiful picture of God. A beautiful picture of God's kingdom and God's heart that was found at just in a glimpse in these words where God says, I am not going to destroy Nineveh. I'll spare you, Nineveh. I want to ask again, what is God calling you to? What is God calling you to? How might God be interrupting your life today? to show a little more clearly his heart and his desire and purpose for us. When I read Jonah, I, I'm always reminded of how badly I don't want to miss it. Of how badly I don't want to miss what God's up to. How badly I don't want to be Jonah running the other way from what God's up to, but I want to see the glimpse of what God's doing that Jonah uh, almost missed out on. I'm reminded of how badly I don't want to miss what God's doing in and through Trinity Hospers. Friends, I, I don't want to miss it because I think it's too hard. I don't want because it is hard. I don't want to miss it because I think it's too messy because it is messy. I don't want to miss it because, because I think I know better than God because I don't. I don't want to miss it for anything. I don't want you to miss it either. And I know you don't want to miss it either. I think this is what we're called to. I believe really, really deeply 
that this is what we're called to, to go into relationships, to go into neighborhoods and workplaces, and to be with people. To be with the people that God is calling back to himself, and to see God show up and to see the Holy Spirit transform lives. We use the number 958 a lot here. If you've not heard that number, we believe around the city of Hospers in a five-mile circle, we believe that there are are 958 people that don't currently live in a loving relationship with God. We desire so deeply for that number to become zero. We believe that we're called to be a place of belonging and of hope and of healing and rest for those people. Let's not run from that. Let's not go to Tarshish. What is God calling you to? Maybe God is calling you to cross your fence, to go on the other side of your fence and engage a neighbor that you don't know real well. Maybe God is calling you to serve. Maybe here at Trinity Hospers, we have a number of areas where we could use volunteers to serve uh, the people around us. Maybe you're being called to serve in an organization that's not part of Trinity Hospers, but, do, but, but is doing the will of God. Maybe you're being called into full-time vocational ministry or maybe into seminary. Maybe, maybe God's calling you to pick up your family, to move across the globe. I don't know. Maybe. I'm not sure what God is calling you to, but I am sure of one thing. I'm sure that he's calling you to something. I'm sure that he's calling me to something. I'm sure that he's calling us to something. We as the church, again, for some unknown, surprising reason, we the church are God's chosen instruments of shalom and of seeing the kingdom come around us. We are God's chosen instruments of belonging and healing and hope. For some reason, God invites us to participate in that with him. The God of the universe, the God that hung stars in the sky, that gives us every single breath that we breathe, that knows every hair on our head, that knows every thought we've ever had and every feeling we feel even before we name it. The God that knows you better than you know yourself, that God is calling you to participate in his redemptive work. He's inviting us to go to Nineveh. Would you go with me? Let's go to Nineveh together. For the sake of God's glory, not for the sake of our glory, not for the sake of seats being filled, but for the sake of God's glory. For the sake of God being famous and people receiving once and for all peace and rest. Let's go to Nineveh. Amen. Would you pray with me? God, you are good. God, your goodness is immeasurable. Your goodness is uh, just not even, uh, not even able to be quantified. We just can't even fathom your goodness. Your ways are not ours, and God, we are so grateful for that. God, I don't know where you're calling each of us to, but God, would you just make us attuned to your voice? Make us attuned to how it is you're calling us to be your instruments of shalom, your instruments of peace and rest in this community or wherever it is that we find ourselves today. Would you give us courage to go to Nineveh? Would you give us courage not to run? Would you give us courage to show up and trust your goodness and trust your sovereignty and trust your plan even when we don't know it even when it feels like an interruption god would that be so for us today in jesus name amen